So you've just started a new mercenary company. Well, everybody's gonna have to grab a job. There is a lot of specialized work to be done. Wait, wait, wait. Your job is thief? And you just tell people that? What is this, some kind of Sims DLC? This video is going to break down everything to do with occupations here in War Tales. Occupations allow your companions to complete specialized tasks here in War Tales. They each come with unique stat boosts and perks as you level up within the occupation. There are currently 8 different occupations, so if you are just starting out or choosing to run a smaller party, then some will have to be left out or switched between as the situation calls for it. Unfortunately, just like in real life, as you switch between jobs, you forget everything that you ever knew about the previous job and have to start over from scratch. This means that you're going to want to find some key occupations that you just lock into companions to be able to gain the rewards of leveling up experience in those occupations. We're going to break down all of the rewards for leveling up the different occupations, break down which classes are best for which jobs, and throw in some bonus tips and tricks that I have picked up from my nearly 100 hours with the game. We have five jobs that are all tied to compendium pages, so we're going to begin with these guys in order. The Tinkerer uses the workshop in camp to be able to craft a wide array of useful items for your companions. These all have unique effects and some of them are absolutely essential for being able to progress in the game such as lockpicks necessary for story missions, pythons necessary to be able to reach some secret areas of the game, torches extremely important for dungeon delves, and even things for the camp such as the cooking pot which is required to be able to get another occupation the cook. My bonus tip here is to remember that when you craft items for the first time you will gain a bonus to your knowledge progress. This means that even if you are uninterested in the effect of the item it can still be worth worth it to craft at least once to be able to get that boost to knowledge so that you can continue unlocking other perks, specifically in the knowledge tree over here or for other occupations, and then you can just turn around and sell the item to be able to recoup some of the expent resources. The perks you receive for leveling up within the Tinkerer occupation allows you to craft higher level items, so this is an important occupation to have a designated companion for to be able to get those advanced crafting opportunities. The stat boost is to your critical hit chance, so really this is beneficial for all companions but is going to really stand out with some synergy to some archer equipment, also your rangers because their entire game plan revolves around dishing out high amounts of burst damage through the backstab, and also your berserkers because critical hits gain stacks of fury which will really ramp up their rampage damage. Final bonus tip for the tinkerer is recipes for new camp gear can often be found at liberated bandit lairs or at tracker camps, so I put a high priority on visiting those locations. The blacksmith is able to forge items armor, armor layers, and even some unique accessories at the anvils that you will find in any blacksmith. These weapons provide the same form of basic attack that you get on the base level weapons you receive when you initially recruit new companions. As far as I'm aware, enemies will never use these exact weapons, so if you appreciate these forms of basic attacks, you're going to have to craft higher level versions if you want upgrades. To me, it's the armor layers that is the most interesting thing you can forge with this occupation. These are going to really allow you to tailor the exact stats that you want onto your companions and specialize them for the role you need them to fill in your team. The main resource bottleneck here is in white leather. This is required for crafting steel items as well as the higher level armor layers. You're either going to need to get really good at hunting ghosts here or be very precise and meticulous in spending the white leather that you do have. The perks for leveling up the occupation allows you to forge the higher level items, so it is important to have a designated companion to rank up as a blacksmith to be able to have access to these awesome armor layers and steel weapons. The stat boost you're getting is a strength increase, so this synergy with a wide range of companions, but there are a few that stand out above the rest. Putting this on somebody who's going to have a large AoE attack is going to get more mileage out of their strength and also somebody who's going to be getting multiple attacks a turn through funneling valor points onto them is going to be able to really utilize that increased strength stat. Next up we have the cook, and they can take raw ingredients and create more efficient meals through combining raw ingredients with salt. They also have a few more advanced recipes that will take multiple ingredients together and be able to provide both food and a troop-wide bonus. To be able to get the cook occupation, you have to craft the cooking pot through the tinkerer, then you will have access to the occupation. You can go to the cooking pot in camp and then be able to start cooking to your heart's content. While I am still trying to get a handle on the food balance after the latest update, the general breakdown is that the cooked versions of food is not necessarily more efficient in terms of cost, because you're taking multiple raw ingredients here together. You could have just purchased 
the same level of extra raw ingredients to be able to have the same food value, but the cooked meals are more efficient in terms of weight. Here we see salt and pork weighing 1.3 pounds being turned into grilled pork weighing 0.7 pounds. So a large stack of pork is going to weigh way more than a large stack of grilled pork. The stews and other more advanced recipes are actually less efficient in terms of the food value of all their raw ingredients combined, but they're giving you this troop-wide bonus, so you have to weigh out the pros and cons of how much you value this bonus. I don't find myself crafting any of the higher level recipes because I just want as much food efficiency as possible, and so that means that leveling up the cook is actually not very beneficial. The perks that you gain just allows you to cook more complicated recipes, and because I've been staying away from those, then you can really make do without and just leaving a novice cook is still going to be able to create the base level improvements like grilled pork and bread. If you're running a smaller party of companions, then this is a job that you can put on a rotation. But if you do choose to level all the way up to companion, you're going to be getting a hefty bonus to constitution. This can benefit absolutely anybody. But if you have somebody who's a designated tank for the party, they are probably the preferred cook. If they feel durable enough without the extra constitution, then switching over to another frontline character, but who may be itemized more for damage, so carrying a two-handed weapon rather than a shield for that extra effective health pool, could help them be more durable because they still have to operate on the front lines. Bonus tip is finding the cooking ladle backpack accessory. You can unlock this after clearing out the Virtusian bandit slayer and then crafting the the salt scoop which will allow you to then craft the advanced cooking ladle which will occasionally refund you cooking ingredients and I find it really nice. If this video has been helpful to you show some support with a like and let's move on to the apothecary. Your alchemist is able to craft an enormous range of helpful items from the crafting table at any apothecary. This breakdown is going to get very involved so buckle up. You can craft medicine here, which is straightforward enough. It just heals party injuries. Your characters will become injured if they drop below half health at the end of a battle. You're also going to be able to create a few options of offhand items. These are fairly straightforward. They just do what they say. Special note here is you're going to be required to use Alizarian powder to create blinding powder and hand bombs. The only location that you can currently use to find Alizarian powder is in a barrel in the cave underneath the Virtusian jail. So deep cut there and yeah, I was also very disappointed when I saw that the Alizar abode did not have a crafting merchant. I'm sure that in the future when they add the full region of Alizar, we're going to have a lot more toys to be able to use to play with our alchemists. Oils is where things are really get fun. These have powerful effects and they get applied to weapons the same way that armor layers get applied to armor. The thing is, a base ingredient of all these oils is going to be pristine essence, which in turn relies on plague-infected outgrowth samples. You get the plague-infected outgrowth samples through fighting the rat infestations, and this is going to worry some people. These are a limited resource in the game. You only get to fight each rat encounter once, and there's only six on the current version of the map. There's a lot going on in these battles, but harvesting these samples is incredibly important, so I'm going to break it all down. You have these plague-infected outgrowths surrounded by poison. Killing these will give you the samples. This map only has six of them. The battle ends when you kill the brood mother, so you have two things going on. One is your party going around trying to collect the samples, and one is fending off the hordes and hordes of plague rats. The brood mother's turn is always last in the initiative, and she is going to call in reinforcing rats from these little holes in the ground. They kind of blend in, but hopefully you're able to spot where they will be coming in. They're going to get an additional reinforcement every single round, so the longer you take, the more overpowering the rats are going to become. Also, if it starts to become nighttime, the rats will be enraged and do extra damage. The plague growths have these effects of being poisoned and having pyrophobia, meaning they'll take additional fire damage and actually be healed from poison damage, and that might make you think that battling them is a game of damage over time effects, but it's actually not at all, because these will never be in the initiative order, so they'll never take a turn. And damage over time effects only activate when the thing they are applied to ends a turn, so if you apply burning to these, it will never do any damage. Loading into these battles, you're going to want to find characters with a large area of effect attacks that will be able to keep the numbers of the rats under control. I also recommend early on cutting the Broodmother down to really low health 
so that you have the opportunity to be able to kill her from a single blow if the battle ever turns against you because her death will immediately end the battle. Now you do want to avoid putting any damage over time effects on her because you want to be able to have the freedom to explore throughout the cavern and clear out these outgrowths. This isn't really part of the guide, but this lineup was just too perfect not to show off. I like to split my forces, have a group with the area effect abilities around the brood mother to be able to keep the rats down to size and also be ready to kill her if the situation calls for it. The rest of my team then soldiers on through the poison, trying to do damage to <laughs> these plague infected outgrowths and cut through them as quickly as possible. I gotta make sure that I have a first aid character in the area uh, who's going to be able to help mitigate the effects of the stacking poison. So over here I have my ranger knife that has first aid to be able to lend out and clear the stacks of poison because if they get out of hand it's going to cut through your health very quickly. The distribution of rat reinforcements every single round is going to depend on how you are spreading out your team. So if you're pushing only a small group out to clear the outgrowths, it might seem like they're perfectly safe one round and then they're going to be surrounded by rats in the next. Depending on how capable you are of dealing with hordes and hordes of rats, you should be able to return with a large number of infected outgrowth samples. I would not hold yourself to trying to get all of them on the map until you have a really good handle on how the mechanics of this fight work because it is fairly different than the other combat encounters you're going to go through. This might also be the one situation where I would recommend having alternate weapon options for some of your characters just because the area of effect attacks are so much more efficient against the hordes of rats. If you really optimize for this battle, you can stay in round after round and just keep on killing rats, but I have had my fill and I want to be able to get on with the rest of the guys, so let's drop her and move on out of this. If you choose to stay and fight excessive waves of rats, you're going to get so many pristine fangs, plague leathers, rat bodies for food, infected blood, etc. These are all useful materials and also sellable. Every victory will also award you a single infected brain, which is what the alchemists are going to require to be traded for the recipes for a lot of these advanced oils. And there we go, our plague infected outgrowth samples have been harvested. Those battles have a few other nuances, like you can usually find bounties, so you get a little bit of extra pay for clearing out those rats. Also, the rats, if they bite you enough times, they stack up fever and have a chance of infecting your characters with the plague, so you can come equipped with cures for the plague or quickly bring them into town to be able to cure them if you don't want to have to deal with the extra hassle and restrictions that comes when they are plague-ridden. But those nuances don't have too much bearing on our apothecary, so we're back here with our alchemist and we can craft with our newly gathered plague-infected samples. Once you have pristine essence as a base, and do note that the fish oil can often be as much of a bottleneck to have as the plague infected outgrowth samples, you can find this stuff as random drops after encounters with bandits, and also there's going to be some caravans that will randomly carry it as well. Check in with your shopkeepers, your merchants, etc. if you're looking to find this. Whenever you craft a new oil, so here we're going to do acidic oil 1, go ahead, prepare that. It is going to give you an additional recipe that you can learn, so let's go back, check it out. It is going to give us a concentrated version of the acidic oil that will function as a belt accessory. Right here, acidic oil concentrates. We can learn this for a knowledge point, and now forging this will cost another copy of acidic oil, so yet another copy of pristine essence, but when you make it, it is going to heavily increase the potency of that original oil. So this acidic oil gets applied to a weapon and then every time a skill deals damage there's going to be a 20% chance that the target gets burning. With the acidic oil concentrate clipped to your character's belt then that goes up to a 50% chance and this allows you to create some incredible combinations. Using these oils and concentrates really helps you synergize your character's skills with their equipment and you can get some amazing combinations. We're going to cover some of those combinations in my character class guides that I'm planning on making, but for now we're just focusing on the occupations, so let's wrap up with the alchemist. Ranking up to apprentice and beyond is what's going to allow you to actually craft the oils. So early on in the game, the alchemist is really not very useful. They're only going to be able to make medicines for you, and you can easily cover that with just paying a few extra crowns to the local apothecary. It's once you're in the mid to late game and you're able to consistently gather large number of plague infected outgrowth samples that you can really go into crafting these oils and make the most of that. 
So I would recommend in the mid game finding a designated companion to become your alchemist because it honestly takes a long time to be able to build up the experience if all you're able to make is the medicines. The skill boost is dexterity, so this is good on either your archers or your rangers. It really doesn't matter which, um, but will be pretty much wasted on any other character right now. We're hopping over to a different save to be able to look at the Scholar. So their compendium page is the runes and codices. We don't really have gameplay around these fleshed out at this point in early access. There's only a single ruin where you're able to pick these up and learn these, and you don't have much interaction there. Your scholar occupation is what is going to allow a character to even attempt to solve puzzles in delves and ruins in the game. They can also be assigned to the lectern in camp, and here you will be able to place ruins, ancient ruins that you gather out of these delves and ruins, and they'll be able to piece them together over time. So the number here is how many rests, while well, they basically work a little bit at the end of camp to try and piece things back together, and they can create anything from near worthless trinkets to really expensive trinkets to legendary unique weapons. At this stage in Early Access, that's really all we can say about the Scholar. They are very important for those key artifacts that you bring in and being able to survive the ruins, which I think is one of the most interesting facets of the game. I'm really looking forward to when they add more. So in the late game, very important. You're going to have to have at least one, but in the early game, you can completely forget about him. And even if you're running a smaller party, you can switch over to the scholar just so that you can attempt the puzzles and be able to navigate the ruins and then switch away from him once he has finished piecing together your loot. I guess I should also say that the stat boost is willpower and I don't really like willpower, so the stat boost feels kind of wasted on anybody. Back to my main save and we have three more occupations that are not tied to compendium pages. Now just because they're not tied to compendium pages doesn't mean that they're any less important or valuable, well, honestly except for the angler, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Your thief is your sticky fingered companion. They are going to be the ones who is personally trying to shoplift any items or pick locks. As they level up, you will gain less suspicion when you steal items, and at the highest level, they can no longer be caught if you get a particularly bad roll if they get caught stealing items. Now don't worry if you're before this and your character does get caught stealing and shipped off to jail, you'll be able to go to the jail and pay their bail, get them back out to help you. Though I have seen a report that one someone's companion got completely lost in the jail system, so I'm not sure if that is a common bug or if they had a unique situation going on there. Lockpicking is required even for main story missions, not just path missions for the crime and chaos path. So even if you're a lawful good paladin at heart, you're going to have to have a thief in the party at least sometimes. The stat boost is a combination of dexterity and critical hit, so this is ideal stats for your archers, for your rangers. They're going to get a lot of mileage out of this. The miners are next occupation, and it might just be my favorite. It allows you to gather iron and precious stones out of the iron veins in the mines. As you level them up, you get an increased chance of being able to pull gemstones out of these iron walls, but honestly, just the stacks of iron are worth it in themselves. The mines refresh these iron veins quite quickly, and so I consistently work in visiting the mines to be able to gather the iron into part of my routine to be able to make a lot of money here in the game. The gemstones are obviously excellent to sell, and the iron ore is essential for being able to craft higher level items, and when you have an excess, then you're able to go over to your tinkerer and just turn out a whole chunk of lockpicks to be able to sell. Lockpicks are both much lighter than the raw iron ore, and they sell for more, and they give your tinkerer a bunch of extra experience, so if you're trying to rank up your tinkerer, this is the best way to do it. Let me know in the comments if you guys have found a more efficient item for crafting in terms of being able to turn around and sell it. The final occupation we have to talk about is the angler, and honestly, in the current state of the game, I think the angler is pretty garbage. He seems to have just been pushed into the game be able to help boost the rating among the RPG crowd who thinks every game is better with fishing. All you can do with the angler is approach fishing holes and you will be able to collect three fish for one fish hook if you are successful at the minigame. He has been worked into one quest that I've found so far over at Merman's Fishery. You actually use him to, as part of the quest, I won't spoil it, but it's in my guide to Vertruce if you are interested. Ranking up the angler doesn't even give you any perks, and his stat boost to willpower and critical hit are just thoroughly meh. Add on top of this the fact that the little fishing holes that you see at the beginning either take forever to respawn, 
or never respawn. I've had some people tell me that they've seen them refresh, but I'm not sure I've ever seen it happen myself. The locations that are labeled as fisheries, so Old Wilbert's here, Merman's, and I'm pretty sure there's one down here in Cortia as well that I discovered on another save. They will refresh also slowly, and the amount of food that you get out of the three fish, especially after the food rebalance, just is not significant at all. That unfortunately leaves the angler down at the very bottom of all of the occupations. It would be the last one that I would give a designated party member to, and honestly, I would forget about it entirely. I wouldn't even worry about switching in and out when you see the fishing holds because the reward are just so minuscule. That's everything there is to know about occupations here in War Tales. You now know exactly how you can specialize your band. Let me know down in the comments if you guys think I missed anything important. Also, I have a number of other guides for War Tales that I am planning on making, so subscribe to the channel if you want to make sure you see when those videos release. Until next time, thank you guys for watching and have a good one.